Before entering the inner sanctum, most pilgrims make a circuit around the third prakaram. They worship at an ancient Ganesha shrine just to the south of the flagstaff. The shrine was built by a popular ashram leader, Sambanda, in 1340. The large Ganesha image in the interior appears red, memorializing a tradition in which the god slays a demon. The Vimana, or roof tower, is brightly colored with images of Ganesha. This is one of eight Vimanas above significant shrines in the first and second Prakram areas. Some pilgrims believe that these structures are docking zones for the celestial vehicles used by major Hindu deities. Abhishekams, bathing rites accompanied by Vedic chanting, are performed periodically on the roof of the inner temple complex. At the climax of these rites, the sacred waters poured on the Vimanas consecrate and draw pranic power down a silver wire to re-energize the murtis in each shrine's inner sanctum. Across from this shrine, at the end of a raised platform, is a circle where pilgrims can stand and see all nine of the temple goparams in Arnachala. It is considered an auspicious place for prayer and meditation. Pilgrims then move clockwise around the temple through an open area bordered by a beautiful gallery that runs around the third prakaram. Storerooms and the temple kitchen are found in this southeast corner of the gallery. The first hall they encounter is called Panir or Rosewater Mandapam. This structure is used during Vasanta Utsavam, the spring festival. This event celebrates the story of Kama, the god of love, who arouses Shiva from his meditation and is turned into ash as punishment. Later, Shiva relents and brings him back to life. A form of Shiva and Parvati known as Lord Somaskanda is carried from his home shrine in a palanquin and installed at the Mandapam. A lamp ceremony takes place there on nine consecutive evenings during the festival. After a dance accompanied by musicians, a celestial nymph arrives from heaven to hover before Somaskanda. Part of these rites involve a procession of the palanquin around a raised platform where three trees stand. The trees commemorate an older grove under which all temple business was conducted in past centuries. Today, pilgrims hang boon cradles on the tree made of cloth weighted down with a stone. When there is wind, they resemble baby cradles swinging in the breeze. Pilgrims do this to petition Shiva for healthy children. When a baby is born, they bring the infant to the temple in a cradle like this, remove the boon cradle, and make an offering. Within this grove stands a four-pillared open shrine with an unusual flat lingam set within a raised stone altar. This Jambu Keshvara lingam is related to the water element. During the spring festival, the lingam inset is filled with water and flowers, and the lingam appears to float in its floral frame. Also on this platform are various shrines to Dakshinamurti, the youthful sage whose silent teaching brings mature disciples to final liberation. The god sits serenely with his right hand in the chin mudra pose, indicating the union of the human soul with Shiva. Next to the platform stand four stones. One of the stones bears inscriptions related to the Vijayanagar kingdom, which ruled between the 14th and 16th centuries in parts of South India. Inscriptions like these give important clues concerning temple history and patronage. To the southwest is the famed Kalyana Mandapam, an ornate wedding hall that is mainly open during the March Full Moon Festival. This feast honors the marriage of Shiva and Parvati and thus the Dharma of marriage and the life of the householder, the second stage of life in Hinduism. The hall is also opened during the Deepam and Navratri festivals when the five major temple deities are brought here for Arti. The interior of the hall is akin to a Tamil art gallery with its elegant pillars hangings, and paintings of stories from the Puranas and the Mahabharata. Other painted designs and sculptures are found along the hall's exterior.
Turning back to the central shrine, pilgrims see these painted nandis along the roof line facing Arnachala, the Mahalingam of the area. As pilgrims continue their circuit around the third prakaram, they come to the temple's west side gopurams. From this perspective, pilgrims can see both the towers and Arnachala looming behind them. The outer tower is the seven-storied Pei, or Ghost Goparam, finished in 1516. It stands 144 feet high. This name references the wild, uncultivated land on the mountain's west side, in comparison with the cultivated east side. The Devarapalakas, or doorkeeper guardians, can be found on each story of the tower. Both the Pei and West Kittai Towers have elegant sculptures of gods and guardian deities. This is Shiva and Parvati on their Mount Nandi. Bhairavar, with his weapons and dog-like canines, stands guard over one tower corner. At the west end of the third Prakaram, there is a shrine believed to house the Samadhi of the great Siddha Idaikatar. Though some claim that the Samadhi is located near the temple Goshala, others insist it is here at a shrine dedicated to Shiva as the great yogi of Arnachala, Arunagiri Yogeshwara. The site consists of a four-pillared mandapam, a Ganesha Murti, a pedestal, and a small image of Yogeshwara within the shrine itself. Tradition has it that from underneath this mandapam, there is an underground passage leading to Adi Anamalai Temple on the western side of the mountain. Local legends tell of a hidden city within the mountain, populated by great cities, saints, and yogis. On the west-facing wall of the second courtyard, colorful protective deities keep watch over the pilgrims. Three important vamanas next draw our attention. The first vamana sits over the temple's inner sanctum. Its three stories contain multiple images of Shiva and his consorts. The inner sanctum contains the fire lingam represented in this painting. It is forbidden to film or photograph the actual fire lingam. Pilgrims report experiencing an overpowering and purifying heat when they stand for darshan before the fire lingam. As researcher Ram Kral explains, the five element lingams have been imbued with a particular frequency by the seed mantras that are continually intoned by the priests. In a sense, the pilgrim is being retuned and purified by this frequency when they approach the lingam for darshan. But that certain stones have the power to retain sound at, a very, at certain frequencies to actually store sound. So these saints in the old days would actually give them out to reach it, so to speak, to, the, to these lingams, in such, to such an extent that it is said that a person who's open in visiting the lingams in the right order, right, in the right way, if they put their ear, their right ear, next to the, next to the lingam, the left ear, next to, they'll actually hear the bishan that it's been impregnated with, or the mantra. So this is now tuning the body, the inner, the subtle body, to the, free, to the pure tone, pure frequency that is, resides in that particular lingam. The second vimana sits over the interior shrine of Dakshinamurti, the young sage who silently teaches final liberation beneath a shaded tree. The third important Vamana, the Natarajar, sits at the northeast side entrance of the Shiva Sanadi and features various images of Shiva Nataraja. The Lord's dance symbolizes the creation of the world, its preservation, and its destruction. It also symbolizes the concealment of the supreme identity and the bestowal of grace that awakens awareness of the devotee's true nature. Beneath the Vamana is this exquisite image of the dancing Shiva, fashioned from five precious metals. A fourth Nandi statue sits within the second Prakaram and faces the fire lingam. This rare photo from the second Prakaram shows Arthi to Shiva and Parvati during the summer solstice celebration. 
To the left of the Fire Lingam Shrine in the first Prakaram is a recess that houses a miniature wooden chariot. Inside the chariot is a small Shiva Chakra called Maha Meru, similar in design to this image. The chakra is constructed of five precious metals and at its apex bears the imprint of Shiva's footprints. It symbolizes the union of the divine masculine and feminine, as well as the cosmic womb from which all creation emerges. The Maha Meru is taken to the bedchamber shrine in the second Prakaram each evening to await the Murti of Ambal, who arrives with great ceremony from the goddess shrine next door. They remain together on a swinging throne until the early dawn when they are returned to their respective shrines. Within the chamber is a well that provides water for the ablutions to these deities. The Kalashams, or finials at the apex of the Goparams, are also part of the energetic grid of the temple. They are designed to attract currents of spiritual energy from the area and to channel them into the temple complex. They also ground lightning strikes and thereby protect other buildings in the area. The Kalashams are believed to charge the entire temple with a profound atmosphere of tranquility. They are re-energized during the Mahakumbhashekams that periodically occur at the temple. As pilgrims exit the inner sanctum, they walk toward the famed Unamalai Aman Shrine, built during the 12th century but renovated in the 20th century. They first worship at the shrine of a seated image of Ganesha. The Ashtalakshmi Mandapam on the temple's east side features this Nandi figure facing the inner sanctum and a gold-coated flagstaff. The surrounding pillars represent the eight forms of Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth and consort of Vishnu. It is not allowed to film inside the inner sanctum, but this view shows pilgrims moving into and out of the shrine. The Unamalai Aman Murti is three foot high and resembles this image that is carried out for darshan on festival days. This is a rare glimpse inside the processional Murti shrine in the second Prakaram. Arthi is being performed to the goddess during Adipuram, the temple flag raising in July. The Murti of Chandrasekhar, a famed devotee of Shiva, also sits within the inner shrine. He symbolizes the single-minded devotion of the pilgrim to Shiva and the meditative state of dhyana, a profound interior focus necessary for liberation. Lord Murugan stands guard to the right of this entrance to the inner shrine. As they emerge from the inner sanctum, pilgrims go to the sacrificial pavilion where they light oil lamps and make petitions to the goddess. Then they walk around the Murtis of the Nine Planets, hoping to ward off their inauspicious influences. Most Shiva temples have a Navagraha Mandapam like this one. Belief in astrology is deeply ingrained in Hindu culture, and the planets are seen as deities to be worshipped and prayed to. All Hindu festivals are closely aligned with the cycles of the planets and constellations to ensure that they are effective in bringing blessings to the people. The Vedas and the Tantric Agamas clearly state that the welfare of the country depends on the annual celebrations of key religious festivals such as Adipuram, Holi, and Deepam. Emerging from the Mother's Mandapam, pilgrims walk toward several other important shrines in the third Prakaram. The first shrine they come to on the north side of the courtyard is the Kalahasti Shrine. The shrine is dedicated to the element air and commemorates the Shiva temple at Kalahasti in Andhra Pradesh, one of the five element temples. The Nandi statue in the hall is unusually elongated and has short horns. Pilgrims make their petitions by whispering in Nandi's ear. Nandi then acts as a messenger conveying the prayers to Lord Shiva. Some pilgrims will close one of his ears while whispering into the other to prevent the wish leaving through the other ear. Pilgrims are careful not to stand in between Nandi and Shiva while making petitions, so they approach him from the side. The figure above the entrance is Kanapar, one of the 63 Shaivite saints of Tamil Nadu. From a young age, he worshipped the Erlingam of Kalahasti. 
Once during puja, Kanapar noticed blood and tears coming from one of the lingam's eyes. Thinking it was injured, he plucked out one of his own eyes with an arrow and placed it on the eye of the lingam. Although this stopped the bleeding in the one eye, he then saw that the other eye had begun oozing blood. He resolved to give Shiva his other eye, but first put his foot over the injured eye on the lingam so that he would know where to place his eye. Lord Shiva saw Kanapar's devotion and restored his vision. From this time forward, Kanapar became one of the 63 Nayanars, Shiva's most arduous devotees. Just to the right of this shrine is the Yagasala shrine. Each time the Panchamurtis are taken out for darshan during Deepam, they are brought before this shrine and given a protective black marking on their foreheads made of ash and butter. During the Maha Kumbha Abhishekam of 2017, homas or sacrificial fires were set up in front of this shrine and a full cadre of Brahmin priests participated in the elaborate rites. Moving farther east, the pilgrim finds four other important shrines. The first is the Pittori Amun Shrine to the goddess Pittori, the fierce aspect of the mother goddess. She holds her weapons, which include a noose, trident, skull cup, and pointed knife. Pittori is related to Shiva's consort Kali, who represents time's power to extinguish life. In small villages, she is often seen as both Shiva and Shakti Parvati, the divine masculine and feminine, and the primary village deity. Lion effigies stand guard at the roof line of this shrine. During Deepam processions, Pittori's Murti is carried by her lion mount. Just in front of the Pittori shrine are two sacrificial altars and this stone trident, a symbol of Shiva's power. A small lion statue faces the inner sanctum, replacing the usual Nandi figure at Shiva shrines. Behind the trident is an ancient bilva tree. This tree is highly valued for its medicinal properties and is often found in Shiva temples. During the four grand festivals each year, small scoops of earth are taken from the area around the tree's trunk and used in various rites. After the rituals, the earth is immersed in the temple's large bathing tanks. To the right of the trident and bilva tree are temples representing three of the five elements. At the far left is the Chidambaram shrine, dedicated to the Akasha or space element. The main murti of the Akasha temple in Chidambaram is Nataraja, the dancing Shiva. His swinging dreadlocks symbolize the Supreme Lord's infinite creative powers, while his graceful pose and calm countenance symbolize the perfect balance of these creative forces in the phenomenal universe. The adjacent shrine is dedicated to Jambu Keshvar, the temple honoring the water element in Truchi. Tradition states that long ago, Parvati mocked Shiva's severe penance. The Mahayogi exiled Parvati to a forest near Truchi, where she found the Ven Naval tree that had grown over the Saint Jumbu. She created a lingam from the river water and worshipped it under this tree until Shiva relented and taught her divine wisdom. To the right of this temple is a shrine dedicated to Ekambareshwar, the temple honoring the earth element in Kanchipuram. According to tradition, Parvati was worshipping a sacred sand lingam in Kanchipuram when a nearby river overflowed, threatening to destroy it. Parvati cradled the lingam to protect it, whereupon Shiva appeared and married her under a nearby mango tree. Weddings are held under this mango tree in Kanchipuram to this day. Including the fire lingam in the inner sanctum, all five elements are represented in this temple, demonstrating their importance for pilgrims. In a sense, the fire temple offers a smaller scale version of the pilgrimage to the Panchabhutas for those who are unable to make the full journey of purification to the other four temples. The fire temple is the site of many important festivals each year. In addition, there are pujas that occur eight times each day. On festival days, such as the new or the full moon, 
the murtis of the presiding deities of the temple are taken out in procession in vehicles like this one. The temple elephant is often a part of these processions and rites. The five main deities of Tiruvannamalai are Anamalai Natar, Unanamalai Ambal, Ganesha, Murugan, and Chandrasekhar, Shiva's steward. Their murtis are carried through the four streets surrounding the temple during the morning and night of festival days. The most important festival at the fire temple is Kartigai Deepam, which occurs over a period of 10 days during the Tamil month of Kartigai. The oldest existing work in Tamil literature, the Tholkapiyam, mentions this fire lighting ritual. The many thousands of pilgrims who flood into Tiruvannamalai during Deepam believe that this divine fire destroys the darkness of egotism and ignorance and grants spiritual illumination to pilgrims. Prior to Deepam, there is a flurry of activity in the temple, including the painting of vehicles used in processions of the Murtis. The three days preceding Deepam feature important processions and rites. The first day focuses on Durga and her special temple, Durga Amman. According to tradition, Durga destroyed the demon Mahasura, who had attacked pilgrims to Arnachala in a great battle. She had then designated four protector deities to guard pilgrims. She is carried out of her temple and through the streets on this day, symbolizing her continued protection of devotees. The second day of the festival features a procession of goddess Pittari riding her lion Vahana to her shrine in the third Prakaram. She is the fierce protector of the temple from evil spirits. Priests perform special pujas in Arthi at this time. On the third day, the Seva Sangam of Chennai travels to the temple to donate the deity umbrellas used during Deepam's processions. Many different organizations donate time and materials to assist with this annual festival which can draw as many as 1.5 million pilgrims. Also on the third day, Murtis of Ganesha and Chandrasekhar are taken on processions through the temple. Periodically, they stop for arti and adornment here at the Yagasala Shrine. As symbols of Shiva's grace and protection for faithful devotees, these darshans are very popular with pilgrims. The Deepam festival proper begins on day one with the hoisting of the flag in the forecourt of the Shiva Sanadi Shrine. This particular flagstaff was installed during the 2002 Mahakumbha Abhishekam, a major renewal of the temple that happens every 12 years. Some traditions state that the person who raises a flag above a temple attains a divine body and can keep company with the gods. When pilgrims witness the flag raising, they are inspired to rise above their baser instincts and achieve God-realization. Some also believe that the temple flag stands as a warning against evil spirits to stay away from this sacred area, for it belongs to Lord Shiva. Once the flag is raised, the five main temple murtis are carried on their palanquins around the flagpole five times. They then are carried to the Alankara Mandapam at the east end of the temple for Darshan. After a procession around the outer streets of the temple, the Panchamurtis are installed in the marriage Mandapam with appropriate worship rites. This will be their home for the next 10 days, and pilgrims passing by the Mandapam can receive their Darshan. At the beginning of any significant festival, pilgrims break coconuts in front of the Murti of a deity. The coconut is seen as the fruit of the gods, and breaking it open symbolizes the destruction of the hard shell of ego. Once the shell is broken, the white meat is exposed, symbolizing the purity of Atman, the divine nature of the jiva. Coconut water is the purest form of water in India and serves as a proper offering for these pujas. The rite expresses the pilgrim's hope that by partaking in the various Deepam rituals, divine knowledge will arise. 
The vahanas used for the evening processions on this first day include Adhikari Nandi, a second form of Shiva's mount. In this form, Nandi is a bullheaded human resting on one knee. He holds a battle axe in his right hand and an antelope in his left. His two other hands are folded together in a gesture of obedience and devotion. He was given the title Adhikara Nandi to indicate that only with his permission can one enter Shiva's sacred precincts. A second vehicle for the evening processions is Anapakshi, a white peacock that lives in the heavens and symbolizes purity, beauty, and divinity. The Shakti goddess, representing the female powers of creation, uses this bird for her mount. The Vahana for the day two processions is Surya, the god of the sun. Surya's traditions are intimately bound together with Deepam and Arnachala. Lord Ganesha usually accompanies Chandrasekhar and his consort in these processions. Day two is also the day the new copper vessel is blessed at the Alankaram Hall before being taken around the temple streets in a tractor. It will later be carried up the mountain. In the evening processions, the Vahana is Indra, the king of the gods and lord of the east. In the Puranas, Indra is a courageous warrior who rides a golden chariot pulled by 10,000 horses. He is regarded by devotees as a generous guarantor of peace and prosperity and the deliverer of rain during times of drought. On Deepam's third day morning, the Vahana is Bhuta, a semi-divine servant of Shiva, who is represented as a human figure on one knee. In the evening of the third day, the Vahana who carries the Panchamurtis is Simha, the lion. When Shiva rides the lion mount, it symbolizes mastery over greed and lust, and ascendancy over animal instincts in general. The fourth day morning Vahana for Chandrasekhar is the Naga. This term refers to mythological serpents and cobras. When Shiva is represented as the great yogi, he has a cobra coiled around his neck. As a vehicle, the coiled serpent represents the kundalini shakti and the realm of desire that Shiva has mastered. The fourth day evening procession features the wish-fulfilling tree Vahana. It represents Arnachala's grace and his granting of blessings to his devotees. The second vehicle on this evening is the divine cow goddess who provides all that is necessary for life. During her procession, she carries the goddess Sarasvati, patron of learning, music, and the arts. As the festival progresses, the size of the vehicles and their ornaments become grander and more elaborate. The fifth day morning procession features Rishabha Vahana, the white bull mount of Shiva, carrying Lord Chandrasekhar and his consort. Also on the fifth day, there is a blessing of the Kalashams, the sacred finials that sit atop the Goparams. The sixth day morning vehicle is a silver elephant that leads a procession of the 63 Nayanars. These six to eight century saint poets exemplified the Bhakti movement in Tamil Nadu. They praised the path of devotion and said it was not inferior to the path of knowledge. The Nayanars taught that expansion of the heart through devotional practices leads to a life of charity and service and to the purification needed for union with Shiva. In the evening, Lord Shiva is carried through the streets in his large silver chariot. Throughout the 10-day festival, Brahmins chant the Vedas and perform yajnas and homas, offerings before a fire. The Brahmins recite Vedic mantras while performing the yajnas and make offerings of ghee, milk, cakes, and grains. The Vahanas carried on large wooden poles are periodically and dramatically rocked from side to side by their bearers in a display of exuberant joy and devotion. In some contexts, images of deities are rocked back and forth in imitation of a baby cradle. The pujas on the final days of Deepam become grander and grander. Traditional dancers entertain pilgrims in the third prakaram.
musicians perform throughout the festival in and around the main temple. The daily processions of Murtis last late into the night. Each vehicle is equipped with a generator to provide the power needed to light up the Murti. These vehicles display Goddess Ambal on her White Bird vehicle and her Cow Goddess mount. The main Shiva image is called Utsava Murti and is made from a combination of gold, silver, copper, zinc, and tin. It is a substitute for the fire lingam, which is never moved. On the final day of Deepam, the Murtis of Shiva and Anamalai Ambal are adorned with regalia studded with priceless gems of great antiquity and beauty. Inside a protected chamber in the inner temple, specially selected members of an ancient lineage of temple Brahmins take the jewels from their cases and put them in the hands of chosen pilgrims. The pilgrims pass them along with great reverence and wonder to a Brahmin priest who places them with care on the Murtis. The seventh day begins the processions of the great chariots. These carved wooden vehicles have been freshly painted for the festival and will bear the Panchamurtis through the four large streets that go around the temple. The chariot carrying Ganesha is the first to set out. Next is the chariot carrying Lord Morrigan and his two consorts. This is followed by the Mahavadam, the grand chariot of Lord Shiva and his consort. Hundreds of thousands of excited pilgrims crowd into the streets, hoping to experience the powerful darshan of the temple deities. Each chariot is richly decorated with floral wreaths, mango leaves, plantain stems, and various banners and festoons. Thousands of joyous pilgrims carry two long metal chains and pull the giant chariots through the streets. According to scholar Susan Bailey, the tour is at once a war chariot, a mobile palace, and a representation of the god's temple. During these festivals, the god or goddess is enthroned on his tur, invested with royal trappings. The great car is then drawn and triumphed along its designated procession route. This route is the deity's symbolic kingdom. Temple priests perform pujas high up on the chariots and pilgrims rain down offerings of flowers. The priests make their entry to the chariots through a special tower. This is also the most popular day for performing the sugarcane cradle vow. It is a common belief that couples will be granted a child by Lord Shiva if they vow to carry the newborn infant around the temple in a cradle made from a pristine silk sari tied to sugarcane. It is especially auspicious to perform the cradle vow during Maharadam. Early on the eighth day, the Deepam cauldron receives puja in the fourth courtyard with the temple elephant in attendance. Tradition then mandates that men of the fishing caste lash it to wooden poles and carry it out of the temple and up to the summit of Arnachala. Wicks and ghee are also carried up the slopes. It is backbreaking work, but there is no shortage of volunteers. Later in the morning, Lord Chandrasekhar is taken on his horse Vahana to the large wooden chariot used on the previous day. After this, a piece of darba grass is transferred from the chariot to the Murti, symbolizing the transfer of the chariot's accumulated energy back to its originator, Chandrasekhar. Once this residual power has been received by the god, he is taken in procession around the temple streets. In the evening procession, the Panchamurtis ride a large horse vahana. The horse has a long time association with mind and air and symbolizes loyalty, speed, focused effort, and energy. Each deity in the procession carries a whip, 
symbolizing the mastery of the mind in devotees whose lives have been submitted to the Lord. On the morning of the ninth day, the mount is Purusha Murugam, or man-beast. It is believed this sphinx-like form wards off evil influences and bad fortune while also washing away sins. In the evening, the Panchamurtis ride the ten-handed Ravana mount. Ravana was a mighty king and warrior who offended Shiva. He suffered great humiliation as a result and was finally reconciled with the Lord after singing hymns of praise for a thousand years. He symbolizes the human ego, arrogant and selfish, who endures profound suffering and samsara before surrendering to the Supreme Reality. In the early morning hours of the tenth day, five pots with ghee are lit, officially beginning the dramatic crescendo of Deepam. From these flames a single taper is kindled and carried throughout the temple. It is kept burning all day. The five pots symbolize the five elements through which the creation appears. The single flame represents the universal Lord Shiva. When the Kritika Deepam flame is lit at sunset, pilgrims experience the merging of the created universe with the one source, Shiva. The mystery of human life, its emergence, journey, and reunion with the Universal One is illumined in the pilgrim's heart. Beginning at dawn on this tenth day, pilgrims of all ages begin their production around the mountain, starting at the Anamalaya Temple. Some climb the mountain itself in a demonstration of devotion and endurance. From a distance they appear as a ribbon of white that moves slowly toward the pinnacle, the focus of their devotion. The path to the top is nearly vertical and passes through small crevices and stones. In spite of thorns that abound on the path, most pilgrims climb the mountain on bare feet. As pilgrims reach the summit, security guards maintain order and move the throngs around the copper vessel that holds the ghee and wicks. Though children as young as three and senior citizens join in, the majority of climbers are between 12 and 30. At 6 p.m., just as the full moon rises in the east, the oil is kindled with embers from a flame lit at dawn from the five earthen pots. The flame is taken to the top of the mountain by a member of the Parvatha Raja clan, part of the fishing caste. Local tradition said that this clan is descended from a king who was given the honor of lighting the cauldron to ward off a curse. Shiva declares in the Shiva Puranam, the Linga mountain and I are identical. It brings devotees to me. This linga confers bliss. Viewed, touched, or meditated upon, it wards off all future births. Celebration of chariot festivals, congregation of devotees, the presentation of sacrificial gifts and offerings of prayers at this place shall bring great blessings. Inside the temple's third prakaram, the Panchamurtis are carried out to the Kachi Mandapam, where they can witness the lighting of the fire on the mountain. The Murti of Ardhana Rishwara, Shiva as half man and half woman, is brought out to the golden sacrificial altar in front of the inner shrine. Also brought out are the five clay pots representing the five elements. They are about to witness Shiva's manifestation at the summit of the mountain. Flames from the five element vessels are joined together and a great cry arises both on the mountain and in the temple below. Arunachala Shiva, Aruhara, Aruhara, Aruhara. The fire is visible to onlookers from miles away in every direction. Fireworks begin their thunderous booms and the temple below is lit up for all to see. The fire is kindled even in the midst of a typhoon, 
which hit the deep bomb lighting in 2016. In this scene, one can barely make out the silhouette of the mountain in a few brief moments when the kindled flame emerges from the clouds. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims will be in Tirunamalai for this one night, so the customary rites must go on, rain or shine. Later that evening, Lord Shiva rides his golden bull Nandi and gives darshan to the assembled pilgrims. This golden vahana was given as a gift to the temple in 2015. The fire in the copper cauldron will be kept burning for the next 10 days. Over 600 kilograms of ghee, 100 meters of cloth, and 4 kilograms of camphor will be consumed for this ritual. On the day following the Mahadipam events, the Panchamurtis, led by Lord Shiva, are taken by tractor for a 14-kilometer ride around the mountain. This rare darshan event happens only during Deepam and Pongal. It gives villagers who have not been able to visit the temple during Deepam a last opportunity to experience darshan. The fire temple in Tiruvannamalai is unique in India. It is considered a mukti stalam, a sacred site where pilgrims may attain final liberation. A verse in the Skanda Purana says, I truly abide on earth in the form of an effulgence named Arnachala for bestowing the attainment of liberation. Know that it is the heart of the world. It is truly Shiva himself. It is his heart abode, a secret holding region. The many millions who visit the temple each year come for a feast of fellowship, communion with their Lord, the fulfillment of prayers, and spiritual transformation. The pilgrimage only grows in popularity with each passing year.